I have a bit of a strange history actually. I went to college to study cooking. I was going to be a chef. I was, I've got an Italian cousin and we we're always going to open a restaurant together. But while I was at college, um, one of the people that taught me management for the hotel and catering business actually was only doing it to earn enough money to help with um, some exiles from Namibia, which was a country, Southwest Africa, that was occupied during the apartheid days by um, the South Africans. And I got very involved in Namibia and then South Africa. I actually worked for a while with the African National Congress. But when I came back to Britain, um, Oxfam were looking for someone to work with them on Namibia. So it was kind of all a bit of an accident. I actually did history and politics and the mix of all of that. But um, actually my first connection was from being a cook um, and this guy that was my, my lecturer. And then I went on and worked at Oxfam for many years and set up Oxfam International in Washington DC during the Clinton presidency. And that was really exciting, trying to make Oxfam into a kind of global campaigning force. We ran very big campaigns like Make Trade Fair, all the Jubilee 2000 and Drop the Debt, all of those campaigns that made a big difference. And then um, I came back to Britain um, and worked for Oxfam for a little while, but then Tony Blair asked me to come and work for him and you know, the, during the days of Make Poverty History and to help organize um, the G8 Glen Eagle Summit, the big one that ad achieved um, huge um, outcomes for the poorest people in the world, which was very exciting. You know, we had Live Eight and we had these big rallies in, in, in Edinburgh and we've got this huge result, which um, doubled aid for the poorest and canceled 100% of debt and committed to providing AIDS drugs to millions of people. And then I was one of the few people that after Tony finished, stayed on and worked for Gordon Brown. I did that same job um, for Gordon of doing his Africa stuff, but then I kind of moved sideways and ended up being his strategic communications director. And then lost the election. And I'd been six years in Downing Street by then. It was probably enough anyway. And um, Save the Children asked me to put my hat in the ring and apply to be the CEO. And it was a kind of good combination of um, my experiences of you know, working on development and emergencies. I'd lived through a lot of the worst and biggest challenges in the last decade, say Rwanda and the genocide, the situation in Somalia, but also then combining it with quite a lot of political nows, how you make things happen. I'd been at all the big G8s and G20s. So it's kind of perfect job, really. Um, great fun. And now I'm at Save the Children. Well, I think it's very, very important to be very, very clear what you're trying to achieve. I mean, changing something very big in Britain is hard, especially if you're trying to do it from government. I mean, there's not a lever you pull and it just happens. So the only way you're going to get from A to B if you want to do something very big is to have a very clear objective and then a, a way of harnessing not just the power of government, but partnerships with people outside government who could be allies in helping achieve that. That might be charities, might be local authorities, it might be the private sector. And I learned in government, if you're really going to make the public sector work, it's these kind of mixed partnerships that are so critical for galvanising change. Let me give you one very small example. So one of the things I did in government was work on trying to reduce the, the level of knife crime. And, you know, the Home Office, different bits of government had tried for years in these in different cities, Manchester, Glasgow, um, Cardiff, where there have been terrible levels of knife crime to, to reduce numbers. But actually, the thing that's really made the biggest dent is, yes, some of those programmes, but then bringing in the families um, of, 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 of members of their families that have been killed in knife crime. And they formed a group called Families United, and their work and their insight combined with what government to do, for me, is what really added something. Um, people like Brooke Kinsella, um, Damiola um, Taylor, um, Dad, Richard Taylor. Um, these people have real insights, but they also have enormous authority. And they've set up their own charities and they have their own outreach programs. And that combination, and they also have a lot of trust, actually, and legitimacy amongst young people. Um, I think is very, very powerful. They go into prisons and talk to young people who've been in North Korea. They've been into schools. They've also have ideas about the right mix of sentencing versus um, preventative action amongst young people themselves. And I think I learned if you really want to create, achieve big social change and use the public sector to do that, it's having a very clear objective, but then creating these unusual partnerships has a big impact. I think it's some um, values in the end. I think the reason that people are so passionate 
in the charity sector is because they believe so much in what they're trying to achieve. It's a mission. Um, you know, they don't get paid as much as people necessarily in the private or government sectors, but they have a real clear sense of mission based on their own values to achieve a lot. Now that makes it complex because everyone thinks that they have a say and they want to run it in their own way. And sometimes the management isn't quite as good as other sectors, but I think that is also getting much better. So that vision and values. I think the other thing about the charity sector, which I think is actually more new than old, I've been you know, in and out of the charity sector, but I think one of the things the charity sector is now pioneering is actually these unusual partnerships, is actually bringing unusual combinations of people together. So for example, as part of our UK poverty work, where we work with the poorest families here in the UK, we have a partnership with Morrison Supermarkets. Now Morrison's is a great values company and they have hundreds of thousands of, of workers around the countries and supermarkets. Now their staff are not only giving us money and raising money from the public, they're involved in some of these programmes that we're running in tough parts of Britain with very poor children. And that's part of their brand, that's part of them as a company. Now I think what charities can do at their best is be really rooted in direct experience, be agile and flexible in terms of how they respond to events, but also forge these unusual partnerships. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's not easy. I mean, we're trying to wrestle with some of the biggest challenges in Britain, but also the world and we have limited resources, but I think we have an ambition, um, particularly at we do at Save the Children, for doing big stuff and not thinking small, but thinking big. But it is very rooted directly in people's lives. I mean, you know, when I talk about UK child poverty, we're working with thousands and thousands of children in this country whose families are living on 10 or 11,000 a year. When I talk about what's happening in in, in, in the rest of the world. It's based on you know, hundreds of staff on the ground in Mogadishu or the Swat Valley or the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have that direct experience and I think that gives us insight and legitimacy to be able to then talk about wider change. This is a really exciting campaign. I mean, we've actually made enormous progress in cutting the number of children that die every year from preventable illnesses like diarrhea, pneumonia, AIDS, malaria. But we still have a long way to go. There's still about 8 million children in the world that die every year. But that has come down from about 12 million only a few years ago. And the point and aim of this campaign is to kind of accelerate the progress. And in the first year of the campaign, we had a big push on one of the major areas that you need to make progress on if you're going to galvanise this acceleration of progress that we want. And that's around vaccines. So we've made progress in cutting child deaths by vaccinating kids for things like measles and diphtheria. But the two biggest killers are actually diarrhoea and pneumonia, kind of chesty cough and an upset tummy, and things that you don't usually die from in Britain. But in the poorest countries in the world, they're the biggest killers, more than malaria, more than more than AIDS of the poorest children. And so we have these new two vaccines and what we've helped working actually with the British government but also the Gates Foundation is get a big result last year to make progress. We actually agreed a huge amount of money that will help save four million children's lives from these preventable illnesses like diarrhea and pneumonia using these new vaccines um, that have been invented. And we're gonna roll them out partly through our own programs but also governments and other agencies will be involved in this. And this will make a big dent on child poverty. The second big push last year was around health workers. None of this really works without frontline health workers. You can't you know, inject vaccines, you can't um, make progress in terms of reducing the, the number of mums that die in childbirth unless you have expertly trained midwives and nurses. So we pushed a lot for a big increase on health workers and made some progress. And this coming year, building on all of that, we're now going to focus on the other big bit of the jigsaw puzzle, kind of vaccines and health workers are two bits of the equation. The third bit is nutrition. And what we want to try and do is look at stopping so many children being hungry and dying of starvation, um, and also so many children um, who, are, who get ill easily because they're hungry. And that's going to be another big push of the No Child Born to Die campaign. I think there are different types of leaders. I mean, I've worked for two prime ministers. I mean, they're big leaders in their environment. I think I learned a lot from Tony Blair. 
um, how important it is, one, to be clear about what you're trying to achieve and, 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 and very determined to get there, but also very how important it is to actually explain constantly why it's important about what you're trying to do. And he, every speech he made was an argument. I mean, from beginning to end, I remember on a, going on a plane once to America and he literally took out a pen and a piece of paper and wrote his speech from beginning to end. And it was an argument about foreign policy that he was giving at Georgetown University. And he, he didn't type it, nobody wrote it up. He had it handwritten, that speech. And he hardly changed a word of it because it was a tightly worked argument from beginning to end. And I think that, that constant need to explain is something I learned from his leadership style. From Gordon Brown, I learned determination. I mean, you know, what he did at the G20 summit, um, you know, arguing and negotiating through the night with other leaders to get a result was you have to be determined, you have to be tenacious at different moments, you have to be very sure that, that what you're trying to achieve is right because you get knocked sideways um, the, the whole time. But I've also learned things um, from people that wouldn't be seen as great leaders but are leaders in their own, own environments. There's a, there's a guy in, in India who we work, for, or work with called Dr. Bang. He works in 39 villages he has this amazing innovative program, he's a follower of Gandhi, where he trained um, a woman in each village to do five things and he dramatically reduced child deaths in those villages, um, down from about 135 per thousand children dying, down to about 30. And these women were trained to how you cut an umbilical cord with a clean scalpel, when a woman gives birth in her own heart, how is a plastic sheet on the ground. Now, he is an amazing leader He's not just done it in 39 villages, he's just persuaded the Indian government now, based on the evidence from that success, to roll it out to 500 million people. And his quiet determination, working in the, one of the most remote parts of India, that's a huge leadership. And he's done that by action, but then he's taken all his knowledge and run a campaign that's now led to massive change that will help 500 million people. And that's a different type of leadership style. But that kind of integrity, that kind of commitment over decades working in a remote part of, it, part of India is something that I admire enormously. And some of the leaders I get to meet through Save the Children are hugely impressive. I was in Mogadishu recently, one again, one of the toughest places in the world to work. And I met the head of our program in South Central Somalia. This is the area that's one of the toughest in the world to, to work in. It's controlled by Al-Shabaab. This is an amazing guy, a kind of six-foot Somali with his Arsenal socks. And um, he every day runs a program with his dozens of staff that help two to three hundred thousand children in the middle of fighting, of wars. He's been doing it for 30 years. Um, and he does that through um, his own morality, his own values, his own integrity, that everyone trusts him, whatever side they're on, because they know he's a good man and he manages to find a way through in this conflict. And I think you can learn a lot about leadership um, from those type of people too.